Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. It's, my name is Daniel Medin, and it's a delight to be here uh, with two wonderful authors, Georgi Gospodinov and Kapka Kasabova, uh, on stage uh, for a panel about uh, the allure and the danger of memories. Uh, I think about the writing, uh, writing itself as a form of taking, but also of giving care. Uh, our conversation today is going to draw extensively on their most recent books. Uh, they're available upstairs in French as well as in English, and uh, strongly encourage you to pick them up. Uh, the authors will also be available after the event uh, to sign copies. Gospodinov's most recent novel is called Time Shelter in English. It's available under the title Le Pays du Passé in French. And the most recent novel, uh, book of, of Kasabovas is To the Lake, A Journey of War and Peace. And the French edition has been titled L'Echo du Lac, Guerre et Paix à Travers les Balkans. And both of these works are profoundly concerned with the ruptures, but also with the continuities between the present and the past. And when I speak of the present and the past, I'm talking about at the individual level, um, at the uh, more local level in terms of family, um, but also in the collective political and historical uh, way as well. And since I raised this question of time and the past, I thought maybe I'd like to ask you, Kapka, to begin, uh, if you could tell me a little bit about the origins of this particular book, which follows another, I mean, in the past you'd written a, a, a book about your childhood in Bulgaria. Um, you wrote a highly acclaimed book about the borders between Greece and Turkey and uh, Bulgaria. Uh, how, what brought you to this particular text, um, which is focused on a different region? Uh, well, it's the same region, but a, a different set of physical borders. Thank you, Daniel. Um, thank you for the introduction. It's wonderful to be here. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Um, this, this journey with the lakes um, sort of started really, I think, like most, I think, most important, most important journeys start for all of us um, with childhood. It started in childhood um, with my grandmother. Um, I call her my Macedonian grandmother, although I grew up in Bulgaria. Um, she came from Macedonia, where these lakes are situated, um, Lake Ohrid and Lake Prespa. And she really seemed to embody um, the lakes, to embody something, to embody something larger than her. I sensed this, um, you know, even before I, I knew what it was. Um, children are very intuitive. Um, and so my interest in this lake I thought of it as one lake, but it turned out to be two lakes. And I thought of it as one country, Macedonia, but it turned out that the two lakes are shared by three countries, um, where I found myself dealing with borders again. After writing the book Border, um, which deliberately kind of, in which I deliberately faced a triple border, um, I had a kind of strong urge to go somewhere to seek boundlessness, not division not separation, not the wound of borders, but a kind of boundless experience through a landscape and also through the exploration of ancestral memory and ancestral inheritance. And so I went to the lake, my grandmother's lake, Lake Ohrid. Um, and it was a journey a long time in the making, yeah, since childhood. It was a, a kind of difficult, it was a difficult, um, thing to face. I think ancestry is always difficult to face. Um, and I think the only way I could face it was through the landscape as a kind of portal, the lake and its hinterland as a portal into this uh, very dense kind of sense of inheritance. Um, so that was really the starting point. The starting point was my, my grandmother. She died quite young. I was still a child. And returning to her lake, to my maternal lake, in a way. Um, and I knew that there would be a whole hinterland of histories and um, stories. And in fact, the second lake, the two lakes are curiously you know, separated on the ground by a limestone mountain. But underground, they are connected by rivers. 
uh, which I'm told is a unique um, sort of phenomenon, unique ecosystem in all of Eurasia. So it's really a remarkable landscape in itself and very symbolic in many ways of the human history, the human experience in that region. And just to locate the lakes, they are in the southwest of the Balkans, um, whereas border was focused on the southeast of the Balkans. So it's broadly speaking the same region. It's broadly it's speaking a vast the same region. region. But at the same time, it's also interesting that even the nature of the border is within the lakes themselves, as opposed before you had a frontier, right, um, that was on, on, on land. And here, you, I mean, this seems to be quite an important feature of the book is that the border is invisible simply because uh, the, the countries share the lakes, but the difference between one part and another part can be seen perhaps by a satellite when artificially divided, but in the actual experience of people who live there is, well, it's, you might say visually invisible, but, 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 but it's manifested in different ways, right? Yeah, I think there's something about a water border, and of course Lake Geneva has one of those borders, um, is, you know, a water border is a fictional one, it's a figment, and I think it only becomes real when, when it is put into action. And, and so there are a number of situations in the book where, you know, I'm trying to cross from one national territory into another, you know, taking boat trips, approaching this, approaching the lake, the middle of the lake, um, either Ohrido or Prespa, from different sides, and finding that nobody was willing to cross that invisible border, which is um, essentially, you know, a, a traumatic kind of state, that people are still in a traumatic state, collectively, um, politically, where the border no longer serves a purpose really, um, it serves a negative purpose. Uh, but its echo, its shadow is so long because, of course, Macedonia and Albania, Albania being the, one of the three countries that shares the two lakes, Macedonia, Albania, and Greece, um, that is where the Iron Curtain, some of the Iron Curtain ran between the then Yugoslav side and Albania for half a century. And so, a water border is, is kind of taking, yeah, it's a kind of rarefied border. It's taking the whole concept and experience of borders and the border experience to a kind of a new level, a more abstracted level. Um, and since I was dealing also with these histories in the family, um, my family to start with, and then the, the lakes being what they are, an expansive kind of geography, you know, I quickly kind of realized that this was not going to be a biographical, a biographical book about my family or even a memoir. It was going to be a book of the lakes. Um, I quickly realized when I started gathering stories from uh, the people of the lakes that the idea that borders are an integral part. Borders and war, the two are kind of, the two go together. <clears throat> That's the subtitle, of course, of the book, right? Well, speaking of revisiting the past, um, the conceit of, 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 of your novel, Georgi, um, which is wonderful and, and playful and entertaining, um, it opens up with the idea of a kind of treatment for Alzheimer's in which the patients are re-immersed in the environments of the past that they're familiar with. So if they were children in the 40s, or 50s or 60s to try to recreate that kind of environment in which they will be at ease. Um, and this idea, this notion, right, um, as the novel proceeds, um, becomes popular even among those who do not suffer from memory loss. Um, and it becomes a metaphor for much larger issues. But since the book opens with this kind of, right, and, and I think the title it represents several things, but you have this notion of time shelter, of, of time that's been preserved and protected for people. And there are so many ideas in this novel. And I can't help but wonder, is, was, was this the origin? Did, did the entire novel, which goes on to talk about so many other things, which we will get to over the course of our conversation, did it begin with this idea? Was, that, was it the notion, what if we could do this? Was that kind of speculation 
of, of, of recreating the past in relation to memory loss. Okay, uh, thank you, Daniel. And first I want to say thank you to the Michalski Foundation and uh, to you. Uh, actually, uh, this place is personally important for me because in 2016 I received here Jan Michalski Prize and it was the first international prize ever I've received. <laughs> so I will remember this, this place. And actually, uh, mm, the idea of the clinic for the past, that's what Ghost in, uh, the main character, actually did in the novel. Uh, the, the idea came maybe 15 years ago. It was part of my notebooks. Uh, and even now uh, I showed to Kapka one of these uh, notes from my notebook is here. Uh, the idea was old, but actually uh, in 2019 I started to write the novel and I was in a hurry to finish it here in Switzerland again, in Zurich. Uh, because there was this feeling of anxiety in the air. Mm -hmm. I think all of us remember something happened with us after 2016. I use this also as an epigraph here. Uh, Virginia Woolf said in one famous sentence that in the December 1910, something in the nature of the human being changed. <laughs> especially in the December 1910. I think something happened in 2016, after 2016. So the anxiety was in the air, the, the anxiety that something wrong happened with us. And uh, in Bulgaria, but also in Europe, but also in the world, it was connected with the coming back of the past, with the, I called it the virus of the past the pandemic of the past. I didn't expect that it will happen with the COVID. It was 2018. Uh, so this feeling that the past is coming very fast to, to us and that there are some populists and politicians that will, that trying to sell us their version of the past. Mm -hmm. uh, I call them dealers of the past and the black market of the past. And that's why I wanted to write this kind of novel about the discreet monster of the past, the discreet monster of the nostalgia. Uh, and uh, as I said, I finished the novel here in 2019. And when the novel, the novel was published exactly in the first week of lockdown in Bulgaria. So it was part of this anti-utopian uh, context uh, of the novel. So it was in the beginning. I really wanted to write about this, uh, this maybe paradoxically, but actually not paradoxically, connection between losing the memory and the flood of the past. Less memory, more past coming. Uh, so that's what, that, that was in the beginning. And of course, politically, that expresses itself through false memories, right? What later on in the novel, at one point, I think you call it ersatz memory. Ersatz memory, yeah. yeah. That, 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 that's yeah, yeah. It, it's exactly ersatz memory. It's like this memory produced by these 3D printers. You, you understand this? Uh, yeah. The, this kind of memory. Oh, the question is how we think about the past, how, how we work with the past. Is it a deep working, trying to understand, or what I'm afraid we are doing, we just make a reenactment of the past. Uh, so this is completely different uh, attitude. Oh, it's, it's a form of fiction writing, reenactment, right? And uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, in the reality, it could be really dangerous. It's, uh, yes, yes. Well, I mean, this is part of the way that the novel is is is, is comically serious. Is um, you know, at different moments, you have these historical reenactments um, that become quite dangerous, such as a reenactment of the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, in which he gets to say, which is quite funny as you read it, you know, it's, it's the second First World War um, that re results of that. And, and that's not the only instance in which there are actual historical events um, 
that involve Bulgarian history, but also European history that implicates the entire continent um, in which there's this kind of reimagining and participating in a collective fiction mm -hmm. about how things had been and uh, which has a reflection and consequences for the present, of course. Yeah, because in the, in the second part of the novel, when the novel became really more, I don't know, political, uh, the countries, the European countries, decide to make the referendums of the past. So to vote, every country uh, decide to vote for the happiest decade in 20th century that they had. And it was very hard to work in this, part, in this part of the novel because I had to ask my friends from different countries. I had to check some history of the countries and to, to imagine what is the happiest decade for Sweden, let's say. If there is a referendum, you know well about the referendums here in this room. Uh, what is the happiest decade that, that they will choose? And uh, yeah. I will give this spoiler, the spoiler for Sweden. It was uh, for the Nordic countries. I don't know if uh, Sion will be agreed. This is the 70s, 1970s, that's a luxury time. It's very interesting how we make our choices. Uh, they are not only defined by the economical reasons or only by the political reasons. They are defined for such small, sometimes small things for irrational things. Uh, popular culture is also important for this. Uh, yeah, this is the second part of the novel, and it was very hard to, to work with it. Well, I can tell you had fun, because of course, you must be curious about Switzerland, and what, does, what decade of the past century does Switzerland decide on? And because Switzerland is also you know, famously neutral, yeah. They basically don't decide. They decide they're going to. It's going to be the moment of the referendum mm -hmm. that will, you know, be the period that they don't live in yeah. forever. So, <laughs> Let's so. keep the secret. <laughs> I, I want to move back to the lakes uh, for a moment, and in particular, not so much about content as um, as about form and and the way that you chose to write this book. Um, being unfamiliar with Macedonia and being unfamiliar with or North Macedonia, uh, the region that you describe in the work. Uh, it's quite remarkable that the, the only visual kind of aid as a reader is the two maps that appear at the beginning of the book. But everything else is written um, and, and descriptive, and, but there's not a single photograph, right? Every single one of those you know, monasteries and these little places carved out of rock, um, I'm reliant either on my imagination or Wikipedia, right? Or, or the internet to find them. And to me, this seems very connected to, I mean, how did you find the way to write into this personal history, as you described, that this was partly uh, a question about you know, the tyranny of ancestry and, and about your grandmother and, and more broadly about the region right, the Balkans, I think, um, too. But it's connected to geology and landscape as well. And I, I was just imagining that it must be challenging to find, you have to recreate that or pursue that analysis but using nothing but words, when, when it also involves memories and, and, and images as well. That's, actually, that's so nicely kind of, so nicely expressed about this yeah, about the nature of experiential writing, which is what I do. Um, experiential journeying and experiential, as opposed to experimental, which it also ends up being. But for me, it begins with experience. And that means sensory experience. You know, that means um, experiencing a place and its people and its, its inhabitants um, through the senses, um, primarily, and then beginning to, um, you know, formulate ideas. So for me, you know, this, I, I guess, exper experiential writing is the, you know, the other face, you know, it's the opposite of academic writing, which is entirely based on ideas or concepts. Mm -hmm. So for me to actually go and meet the lakes in person um, was, 
I was quite clear that everything would follow from there. That I already had a lot of material from my own family in terms of themes. And because I'm primarily a psychological writer, I'm interested in, it, for me, everything be, be, begins at the psychological level or at the emotional level. There's got to be a drive, an obsession, a compulsion, um, something that feels urgent, not in a current events way, but urgent to me. And, you know, I, I like what you say about something happened collectively in 2016. I, I think, you know, a lot of us writers are kind of attuned, who knows why, but we seem to be attuned, you know, to the before and after of what, what we call events, what we, in the mainstream is, you know, events that manifest as events also have a very long kind of preparation or gestation yeah, period, mm -hmm. and then a very long aftermath. Um, and, and I've always felt as if, perhaps because of where I've grown up, like you, mm -hmm. uh, also because of family reasons, cultural reasons, and personal reasons, you know, who I am, um, I've always felt like I've lived in the aftermath of something big, and sometimes in the lead up to something. So, so I always end up having a feeling of premonition <laughs> or a feeling of aftermath that I need to deal with, which is why I write. <laughs> and, so, and so the lakes, the approach to the lakes was sensory primarily and, and psycho-emotional. And as you say, you know, geological, it's almost as if, you know, the lakes are one of those places on earth that um, have its own language. You know, some places are very potent like that. In, in one of my earlier visits to the lake, I met this young monk and there are a lot of uh, rock monasteries, you touched on that, uh, and rock churches in the shores of Lake Ohrid and Lake Prespa. It, it was actually known in the Middle Ages as the Balkan Jerusalem. And Lake Ohrid itself is famous for having, uh, maybe having had 365 churches uh, for every day of the year. Uh, of course, later on, those churches were, some of them were converted into mosques as the Ottoman Empire arrived. Um, and there are still some remains of that, of the Ottoman heritage, some mosques. That's a very interesting subject. I, I became interested, thanks to uh, meeting the people of the lake, um, in, for example, the history of Sufism, mystical Islam, in the Balkans, which still survives. And, you know, I had no idea that on the shores of Lake Ohrid there is one last teke, or Sufi lodge, where there are whirling dervishes, um, there are still whirling dervishes. Some of them are women. I had no idea that, because it's not in the mainstream. It's not mainstream knowledge. Um, and the lakes were full of um, wonderful human stories that link to the larger epic, truly epic history of the region. And yes, it all started with um, tapping into the particular energy of Lake Ohrid, it has a very particular energy, very kind of concentrated. The young monk that I met said to me, um, you know, wh where is your grandmother buried? And I said, not here, you know, she's from the lake, but she's buried across the border in Sofia. And he said, oh, it doesn't matter because her soul will drift back here because Lake Ohrid is a place where souls gather. It's a gathering of souls. And he was right. I mean, I kind of dismissed that as, as uh, you know, as, as being, being kind of a, a metaphor pushed too far. But um, after spending a while on the lake with its people, in its places, um, it is a gathering of souls, a gathering of stories. And there is one chapter in the book called Roads, which touches specifically on the Sufi history of mystical Islam arriving in the Balkans and, and the, the few remaining individuals who still hold this kind of very particular tradition um, of mystical Islam um, and its ideas of ecstasy and art and um, refinement of the senses, um, going back to this idea of experiencing, experiencing reality. Um, at all its levels. Um, yeah, it all began with, with the people of the lakes. That's, that's when I really felt the book come to life. Um, and in a way, you know, I think each book dictates its own form, each subject. So in a way, the lakes dictated the shape of the book. Um, along, with, 
along with your readings, along with the stories that you encountered and that you heard during the travels. It feels as though it, it's fun to always revisit an epigraph when you finish a book. And I think this is a, the one to this book, which is taken from the American naturalist uh, Thoreau, um, is a lake is the landscape's most beautiful and expressive feature. It is the Earth's eye, looking into which the beholder measures the depth of his own nature, right, or her own nature. But there's a way in which that kind of um, interaction with the environment is, is already embodied um, mm. in, in that passage. Georgi, I want to ask you also a question about form. Um, for those who have not had the pleasure of, of, of reading his novels, I, I should say from the outset that you will not encounter um, a, a strictly realist form in which you have a clear narrative-based plot that has a beginning and a middle and an end and you know three-dimensional characters, right? Um, you, 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 see, you practice what is sometimes called metafiction. Um, it is full of games. It is full of play. But, but the inherent is that is, is, is a complete rejection of certain forms of storytelling. And I wonder if you could say something about approach and method and why it's congenial to you for this story and for this material. Yes. Um... It couldn't be in a different way, because it's a novel about losing of memory. So even the narrator in the novel, in the end of the novel, he's losing his memory. And that's the reason that you couldn't have a kind of straight novel with the beginning, middle, and the end. Uh, this is one reason. The other reason is that uh, I'm coming, but Kapka as well, from a tradition with a monumentalistic literature. I really hate to, uh, to, to have this big socialistic uh, tradition of the novel that everything is described, everything is logically and ideologically <laughs> <laughs> explained. So uh, all my novels, there are only three, uh, they have this kind of structure, fragmented uh, structure, uh, because I think it's closer to our way of thinking, to our way of living. We don't live in one genre only. We don't we don't think uh, like like a trains who are traveling from point A to point B. Our stories are not like this. They never been like this. Uh, the third reason maybe that is that I'm coming from a tradition of a oral storytelling. I used to live with my grandparents, and uh, the way they told their stories was the stories with uh, many corridors, <laughs> where you start to talk about something, then stop, then make another story, that you're coming back to this story. But this is the way uh, of Sheikh Rizat telling the stories of Arabian Nights. So it's a very old uh, shape or form uh, for storytelling. Uh, and maybe the last reason to have this nonlinear uh, line is that uh, in the past, in our memories, the time doesn't flow in one direction, actually. When you, you are in your past, the time is really have another physics of traveling. That's, That's funny, too, because this sounds to me like another version of experiential writing, right? Yeah. It's uh, um, in, in, in creating a form that resembles our, our own experience. If I can just interject, uh, yeah, because I, I mean, I like how you put it. This, I think you really um, hit on something there when you say mono, monumentalistic and you know, I come across this, you know, the, 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 this phenomenon of monomaniacal or monocultural versions of reality, of the past, of history, especially national history, you know, um, which is in a way, so this problem with how we collectively remember, how we are encouraged to remember collectively as nations or as families. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, 
um, with the lakes, I really felt that nations are just big families. The psychological principles that operate in families also operate on a larger scale in, in nations. Um, and this, I think this trimming away, this trimming away, this cleansing of the past is extremely dangerous. Um, I think it's, it's especially kind of um, noticeable in Balkan national histories, how history in the different Balkan nations are narrated, the, the official history, how that um, is taught to children, what's in the mainstream, um, and what is absent, what has been, you know, cut away. So for me, the parallel is ecological, you know, in a place where there has been ecological devastation, and so the multi-tributary river has been turned into a canal. It's a similar thing with memory, recollection, and history, this monomania, which is a form of insanity. Um, and we don't even feel it how, you know, feel how it creeps up on us from different sources. Yeah, we should say that the past is a personal thing, and because of that, it could be full of diversity because you couldn't uh, make channel of the past. The past is really like a, yeah, like a river with the labyrinth, with everything. And uh, because we are coming from this kind of ideology that try to make, to have the, the ideologies, not only communist ideology, they love the collective past, of course. They want to have one story, uh, national story, national memory, they build it on this. And when you have your personal past, when you try to tell your personal style, past, it doesn't fit with the main frame of the ideological collective memory. And uh, yeah, that's why it's, uh, it's important to tell our personal, uh, our personal stories, our personal stories of what happened, actually. They are, in a way, provocative and subversive. It's almost like industrialization. I mean, this is the industri on the one hand, the industrial approach to history, you know. Industrialization of the past. <laughs> yes, yes. Versus the organic, diverse, natural kind of um, unfoldment of, of events. And it, it just seems to me that, you know, just to carry on from this thread, because I think this is very much at the, at the heart of what um, Georgi and I do, is this urge to, um, obviously, you know, it's, in, it's intuitive, but it, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that we write the way we write coming from the culture where we grew up. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, there is almost an urge to kind of, to, to hear what hasn't been heard before, to kind of tune into these forgotten, forgotten voices or forgotten, find the forgotten tributaries of the river um, because there is no memorialization for them in official narratives, because they have been discredited and um, suppressed and industrialized, um, because, you know, it has been a kind of ecological catastrophe to have this kind of um, version of history. So it's almost as if, you know, in a place where really the past is not yet past, you know, in a culture like that, um, there is a greater need, I think, for individual kind of, individual um, expression of these undercurrents, which is what you're talking about, the, the personal undercurrents of these monolithic, <laughs> these monolithic narratives, um, these crushing, yeah, monumental narratives. I think you've both already suggested um, the political dangers of these monolithic narratives and of reducing complex individual histories to a single kind of in industrial pattern. Um, I'm interested also in the way that writing can serve as not just uh, as, as, as some, a form of, I think Czesław Miłosz the Polish poet referred to writing as a form of rescue. That also at the same time that there's also this other side in which there's the possibility of preserving precisely that, the individualistic stories with corridors, right? Um, I feel that very clearly, certainly in the way that the individuals who populate 
to the lake are, for most readers in this audience, I would think invisible, except for the fact that you may have family, right, who are not on the news every day and telling their stories, their studies. Stories are, for the most part, inaudible. You know, it's not part of the larger narrative of, of of life today in Europe. Um, and it feels as though there's a kind of urgency, at least in your interactions, while there may be a search that is personal in its origins, it feels as though there's, there's a need also that these voices and that these particular stories, they're not forced into a harmony, but, but, but that actually preserving them somehow by having, well, documentation, I suppose, would be the word for it, maybe. Oh. Perhaps, I mean, uh, my aim is not to document, but, um, um, you know, it can be read that way. It is, you know, I guess, I guess my aim is to have experiences of, of learning something, you know, to get closer to actually really knowing the truth, you know, of this family's history, of my family's history, of the nature of human suffering, really. I think this is, this is what's at the heart of, if there was a drive for me, it was this desperate question I had from the beginning, you know, the the first chapter of the book um, summarizes my, the family history, especially running down the female line, um, and this passing on of what I call the pain, mm. the passing on of the pain, you know, like a sort of um, a pass the parcel game. It's what families do. They pass on the parcel, you know. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm so sick of this. I'm so sick of com compulsive suffering. Mm -hmm. um, so going really going to back to the lakes was an attempt to break free of that of that the tyranny of suffering of kind of inherited suffering and i'm very aware that in the balkans i was aware from the beginning and became even more aware of it um, after time on the lakes in the balkans this kind of suffering you know um, that comes from monolithic versions of history um, is per perpetuated um, culturally. So really, you know, it's an ecosystem. It's an ecosystem of stories and voices. And, you know, a few themes emerged from the lakes, tyranny and escape from tyranny, or suffering and how to transcend suffering. You know, families, individuals who have really had incredible um, experiences, and I learned a lot from them. And I think the reader can really kind of, you know, like a mirror. The lakes are a mirror world. It's full of mirror images across this invisible border, you know. Um, and I think, I hope that the book is a kind of mirror uh, for the reader, regardless of their cultural background, where, you know, it's, it's a kind of safe space to contemplate dangerous questions about who we are. Um, this is interesting. Maybe this is more of a prompt than a question, but it's something that has preoccupied me for some time, um, and in particular, a conversation with a writer from Rwanda who was here last uh, year at the festival, and uh, the notion of transgenerational um, trauma, um, and uh, the question of whether or not suffering at one moment in history is something that can be inherited. Um, by the next generation, right? You have this sort. There's a little bit of that in your book at the very beginning, right? With in terms of the the family history, why the, the unhappiness, the melancholy. Um, like, is there something that? How do these things get passed on from one generation to the next? Um, what is the way that that can manifest itself? And then, of course, the the example that you have just cited, the the one that is historically dangerous, the one in which particular forms of, of historical suffering or victimhood, imagined victimhood, um, are constantly renewed <laughs> from one generation to the next. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, this not so much a question as I think that's something that is, uh, it's pursued without providing necessarily an answer for it um, in the book. Yeah, um, it was certainly a question I pursued, but I also encountered again and again as I, um, you know, sat down with people to listen to their stories, which is my favorite pastime. Um, and, and, and how their stories were a mirroring of my family story. And there is a chapter at the end of the book called The Howl, uh, Le Hurlement, where yeah. 
I, I, I go to the Greek side of Lake Prespa uh, with a friend um, whose grandparents are Macedonian from all the corners of, um, of Macedonia, who is, a, who is otherwise Australian. And we have this experience, you know, I, all my journeys are solo, but in this chapter I actually travel with him. And we visit um, places devastated uh, forever, or at least to this day, by the Greek Civil War. Um, and we kind of re, yeah, we revisit the, yeah, the legacy of the Greek Civil War, which is a little known, another little known important kind of event, uh, which is not part of mainstream European history, and yet the Greek Civil War um, was, you know, a major European war, the first hot war of the Cold War, and it followed on from World War II. And so to exp you know, how this is still felt in the land, in these villages that are obliterated, in Nick, my friend Nick's family history, he's the product of that war and its aftermath, um, and the migrations that it caused, um, and how our histories reflect each other. And it's perhaps the chapter where I felt that I was coming to some kind of, I don't know, um, some point of understanding of how the cycle, this kind of vicious cycle of suffering, grievances, perpetual, you know, repeating the past, can be interrupted. Um, it's almost an, a kind of alchemical process, I think, of where you need, you need to instigate transformation at some point. Uh, and I think that transformation is only possible through a deep understanding and kind of confrontation with, with pain, yeah. with the pain that you carry, because we all do. We all carry unprocessed pain, undigested history, you know? Mm. There's one point at which, um, well, there are several points at which the two books um, that you've written overlap. But one aspect that they share in common, of course, is Bulgaria and, and uh, Bulgarian history um, in the way that Bulgarians are present in the book. Um, and in fact, there is one author um, who is quoted by both of you uh, at one point. And I thought I'd bring him up here because it seems relevant in different ways um, to your respective projects. He's a poet from... Uh, who lived from 1895 to 1925, named, and forgive my pronunciation, um, Geo Milev, um, who at one point provides an epigraph for you um, during the moment when you're talking about Bulgarian history. He appears as well. Could you perhaps introduce this poet and figure and maybe say something about why he was important to, to why he makes the appearance that he does in your book? Actually, it appears in your book. For me, uh, Georg Milev is uh, the very important uh, Bulgarian poet, very European Bulgarian poet, which is important as well. And, uh, but as far as the poet, I'm using another poet in my novel, uh, Winston Hugh Oden, which is uh, who is connected with the Second World War. And uh, you remember these famous lines from the poem, 1st of September, 1939. I sit in one of the dive of 52nd Street, uncertain and afraid. And this feeling of uncertainty uh, was very important for the beginning of my novel because uh, in Time Shelter, this, 1st of September 1939 is the, the day that I think is the most important date of the 20th century. And even now, when things started with Ukraine and with the Russian invasion, you know how we had this kind of repetition again and again. Uh, we have this... Uh, the war started actually in... 4 o'clock, 48 minutes, if you remember clearly now. And at the same time, it started, the, at the same time, Second World War started. The German invasion in Poland was on 1st of September, 4 o'clock, 47 minutes. Exactly at the same time. Maybe this is the time when usually the war started. 
this is the yeah. Uh, but I started this uh, because of the Geomilev and uh, now uh, Odin. Uh, I wanted to say that poets actually always catch this anxiety in the air, in a way. So I think that Geomilev was important also, and because of that. Yeah, he was a he was a symbolist poet in working in the symbolist tradition. Yeah. Um, and in um, into the lake, um, I use a small excerpt from his beautiful war diary from World War I, where he spent years on the Macedonian front, which was one of the most, well, it was the most strategic front in the Balkans. Uh, the French army was very present there, especially uh, the French Oriental army, uh, which was fighting with the Bulgarian army. And in fact, the mountain that separates the two lakes um, on the surface of the earth is where you can still see remains of trenches from that war, which is extraordinary, an extraordinary sort of thing. Uh, and where the Bulgarian army faced off uh, uh, Oriental, uh, uh, yeah, the French Oriental Army, um, who were mostly North Africans fighting this horrendous war, you know, for four years. So it was mostly a kind of um, a kind of stalemate rather than active combat. Um, and Georg Milev was there, and he said, um, on the French side, they are singing. I want to join in, too. They are singing the song of Solveig, but only on the French side are they singing. And it kind of, yeah, I think these are the moments of, of the war that really interested me of, of the First World War and the Second World War, and all the wars that have followed, which have all had, you know, untold kind of, intimate, uh, there are untold intimate stories. And of course, my family is one of, one of those stories, these regularly recurring European wars. And of course, it even expands beyond that um, to the extent that uh, in the case of Milev's fate, somebody who lost his eye in the First World War, right, um, and had a head injury, mm. um, he's assassinated some years later, by the far right, uh, by royalist forces after a failed uprising, and placed in a mass grave. But effectively, he's disappeared. And then years later, like so much of the past that we're discovering, mm -hmm. when, right, I don't know the full story about this, but, but years later, um, a ma the mass grave was yeah. found. Because of, the because of the glass eye, they were able to identify and confirm that he'd been strangled to death you know, um, by the royalist forces. But it's this way of, that's also the past coming back uh, with greater clarity in some respects. Oh, that's not a very happy um, concluding example. But um, we do have some time to, to open things up for, for questions uh, from the audience. Uh, also, we have interpreters as well. So if you prefer to ask your question in French, please do, but allow uh, the author the authors or author, well, only one would need it, but um, time to put the headphones on. I want to say something. If, okay, do, do you have questions? Ah, yeah. Merci, merci bien. Je vais, je vais peut-être quand même poser ma question en anglais. I, I, will, I will ask my question in English to, to both our distinguished authors. Let me present myself. I'm, I'm a diplomat and I'm, I'm representing Bulgaria in, in Geneva uh, at the international organizations there, the United Nations and other international organizations. And I'm very happy to see two outstanding contemporary Bulgarian uh, writers in front of us here in, in Geneva on the borders of this uh, lake. And as a diplomat, uh, uh, of course I'm dealing a lot with borders, with, with issues of territory, with relations of people across borders. And you're dealing in a different way with very similar issues, but from a very different perspective. Understand that 
uh, Kapka Kasabova is dealing with, uh, uh, in a way, dismantling of those borders that separate uh, uh, the, uh, the spiritual uh, and uh, mental, psychological, cultural existence of, uh, of, of communities, of people, of nations. Uh, and uh, uh, in, in, in his latest novel, in his most recent novel, uh, Georgi Ospodinov actually deals with temporal boundaries and the way, in a fictional way, these temporal boundaries at a certain point are called to uh, replace or displace the territorial, the, 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 the geographical, the, the, the geopolitical boundaries. Uh, so in, 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 in both your recent works, uh, you're dealing with the effect of boundaries on past and present. But as Kapka said, uh, both of your works and the inspiration for, for them was related to a, not only of your perception and understanding and feeling about past and present, but also premonition of what is upcoming. And my, my question would be, what, what path to the future you feel, I, I wouldn't say you, you, you predict or you foresee, but you feel uh, building on your experiences with, 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 with the stories, the novels mm. you, you have written and with the experience of writing these stories, what, what kind of a path to the future you have, you have sent it, both of you. If, okay. if you could share this with us, of course, it would be very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you. this. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Great question. I'm not sure if I could give a great answer for this. But, uh, <laughs> you know, in our past, we had more future than now. Uh, now the future is, yeah, now the future is uh, cancelled, <laughs> let's say. And that's the problem. That's why I'm writing this novel, Time Shelter, because when you're living in anxiety present, a presence full of anxieties, and the future is cancelled. You have only one direction to move. And this is to the shelters of the past. But I'm shelter is also connected with the bomb shelter. When I published the novel, actually, I, I was like, OK, now I should explain to my young readers what is the bomb shelter means. Because nobody will know what bomb shelter means. And it's connected with time shelter. And now I should admit that, yeah, everybody knows. I think bomb shelter will be the word of the year. Anyway, uh, so about the past. I love one, do you know that there is a, a tribe of Aymara, Aymara tribe? I, I write about this in the novel. For this tribe, it's in, uh, in Chile, I think. So for them, for Aymara people, the past, is always in front of you because you know what happened and uh, the future is always behind you because you don't know it. it it's just coming back to you. And look, it, it's another, another point of view, which is, uh, we know that uh, our point of view is completely different, but let's see on this way also. Uh, the other thing about the past and the present in the, in the Bible, let's say. In the Bible, just remind the wife of Lot, the Lot's wife. It's not good to look back at the past because you will become a pillar of salt. Uh, there are many, many interpretations about the, 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 the past. And that's important, as we said in our talk, to have all these point of views about the past and present, not only our modern European uh, view. Uh, I don't want I I don't want to to live again in the past, again and again and again. On 24 of February, when it started. I must admit, I opened my laptop and I wrote in Google what to do when the uh, atom bomb, or how, how they call this, nuclear, uh, 
how to do when nuclear weapon was used. And actually, it was part of my memory when I was a student, when I was in the school. They explained to us every week what you should do when the Americans throwing us nuclear weapon. And the only thing that I remember, I remember that there are not so many things that you, you could do with this. The only thing I remember that I shouldn't watch directly in the, this mushroom of the light because I will go blind. <laughs> and I, what was the problem? What was the traumatic thing that now I had a 14 years old daughter and I had to explain her my personal <laughs> fears because it was our fears on this time. Uh, so I had to explain her my fears and I had to explain her what it, does it mean nuclear bomb, time shelter, gas mask. So this is the returning of the past and this is the bad way that the past could return. They are not, I'm not sure if there is a good way, actually. So that's why we are telling stories, that's why we are writing novels, just to produce memory and to be allowed to say, okay, this is the past, I used to live in this, I don't want to come back again. So that's my answer. Yeah, you know, it just reminds me, what you were saying reminds me um, um, of a groundbreaking American psychiatrist, Selma Feiberg, who, um, who summarized, she was a child psychiatrist, and I quote her in the book, she, she summarized the nature of trauma in three words, repetition, repetition, repetition. So I think, you know, when we witness the repetition of the past in, in, in ways that we thought were behind us but seemed to be actually coming towards us, <clears throat> And the war in Ukraine is, um, is, is along those lines. Um, and so was the war in Syria, of course. That is a product of a traumatic timeline. I'm almost getting the feeling that at the moment we are struggling with multiple timelines. Um, and the traumatic timeline demands repetition, repetition, repetition. But um, it's not the only timeline. And I don't think that the future is cancelled. Um, I think the future is kind of hurtling towards us at great speed. And for me personally, but I also think, you know, there is something, something um, on the collective level in this. I don't know. One of the antidotes for this diseased state of affairs, you know, this traumatic state, um, is direct experience, direct encounter. And I couldn't be a writer if I didn't have encounters with places and people and my own nature, um, therefore. Um, I couldn't simply generate memories or content or ideas in my head. Um, I need the direct experience that I think alchemizes and transforms the trauma, you know, um, the, this inherited kind of pain into something of a lighter nature that can actually show a path forwards. Because I think there is, you know, there is a different timeline. Um, and I think mm. that there's care in both yeah. responses. Uh, and the, the attempt to transform things also. Of course, making something, writing a book um, is, 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 is a response too. To Actually, uh, the, yeah. But telling stories, so hearing the other stories, listen to the stories of the others, could be also a direct experience. It's not, yeah, because we are this kind of being, living being, that this is, uh, uh, if you listen to the story of someone or a kid that crossing the border with a written phone number on the hand or with something like this, it's a direct experience as well. That's why you have this feeling that that it's not fair, something should be done. Uh, so I think that storytelling is also direct experience. And even, uh, I write about this in my book, sometimes we have memories from the things that never happened. Yeah, it's, it's true. Uh, or we have memories from the things that we just read about this. 
from the things that happened to the other people, but they told to us, and I have this like my memories. And this is also important. It's, it's, a, par it's a part of the, what to say, the, the power of literature, let's say. Also the power, I prefer to say the power of storytelling, because not only literature is important. It's important to exchange stories. This is, this is also important for the Alzheimer, actually, against Alzheimer, because your stories uh, triggers for the, the stories of the other people, and so on and so on. Uh, yeah, yeah I this. think we want to be transformed. I think as readers, as a reader, I want to be transformed when mm -hmm. I read a book. As a writer, you know, I set off on a journey, external and internal, you know, that I want to be transformed by. And I think without this kind of element of transformation, all we have is just repetition, repetition, repetition. And that's where I think all of us are transformed, you know, at the individual, intimate level personal level, by experience, not by some abstract idea or by some opinion or by social media. It's ex direct experience that transforms us. That's a wonderful final note. Um, I'm going to repeat what I stated earlier. We have these fantastic books upstairs in more than one language. Uh, please <laughs> support the, the bookstores and the publishers and the authors. And, and while you have this opportunity, uh, say hello, greet the authors, and, and, and let them sign your copy. Uh, thank you very much for coming. And if we could maybe just have a warm round of applause again for the audience. Thank you, Daniel.